to give out a few presents from the Rimini kids. Well, the first one is for Cody, right? Okay. Happy Father's Day, Cody. <laughs> I'm not a talker like Leslie, so this is just going to be short and sweet. <laughs> so the first one is for the most wisest or experienced father. So who has the most years on? What, how, where do we start? Okay, 50. Everyone stand up who's 50 or older that's a dad. Nobody's 50? Everyone's less than 50? <laughs> All right, let's do 55 and older. Uh, 60 and older, 62 and older, uh, 65 and older, okay, uh, 67 and older, I'm not very good at who's, who's older, is that brother Gene, okay, hey, you're 90, okay, then you get it. <laughs> Brother G, in the back. This is what I don't do. Okay. Alright, who's the youngest father? Let's do. Is anyone younger than 20? No? Okay. Uh, 25? Anyone that father that's 25, 27? So Alex gets it. Oh, Josh? Oh, Josh, too. Where's Josh? Alex, how old are you? Oh, yeah, so Alex gets it. Okay. Right there. And what is this one? Okay, who has at least five family members with him today? Anybody? Donnie, how many do you have? No. Alex, is that you? We all know Alex wins with Woo! 25. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, everyone. I'm sorry that was a little crazy. <laughs> I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> yeah, Praise I'm the Lord. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Let's all stand and worship the Lord together. Father, we just worship you today, God, and we give you glory. Father, we just pray this morning that you would just touch us, God, and help us enter into your presence today. Father, we just give you glory and honor because you are a good, good Father. Father, we just we just worship you today. And we're so thankful, God, that you give us the privilege to come before you today and worship you together in spirit and in truth. We know this is a privilege, God, that's not afforded to everyone. And so, Father, we don't take it lightly. Let today be a day, a new day, God, an anointed day, Father. Let it be a day of revelation, Lord, and change, God, and a day of miracles, signs, and wonders. Let it not be just another Monday and Sunday, God, where we go through the motions. But, Father, I pray and ask that your Holy Spirit be here with us this morning. God, that you would manifest yourself with us today, God. Come to your children today, Father God, and show us your great mighty works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise today. Oh, 
Welcome to the house of the Lord. The reason I'm not shouting and yelling is because I got something I want to tell you this morning. You know, the word declares, Brother Ron, it says they were overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. It's a twofold type deal here. The blood was already spilled, the blood was already poured out, but we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word. Share y'all over, Shakaya. A few weeks ago, my baby girl, y'all heard that her eye was 2150. 2150, and when she goes to the doctor, this specialist eye doctor told her and said, There's at seven years old, it's a cutoff date, it's not going to turn around. But we can try. <laughs> but my God is greater. And we prayed for that service, and, and I told my brother, I said, Donnie, go to the back back there. 
And I want you to begin to start holding up fingers. Many of y'all don't know what I was doing, but see, I have faith and I believe that God is able to do miraculous above all that I can able to think or ask. And I said, baby, what do you see? And she began to point out the fingers that he was holding up. So when we go and we get her glasses, she immediately saw double vision. That wasn't supposed to happen. So we went to the doctor, and in six weeks, in six weeks, the doctor used this word. She said, remarkable. And God wanted me to look it up, and these are some words that, that are similar to remarkable, remarkable, extraordinary, exceptional, amazing, astonishing, astounding, marvelous, wonderful, sensual, stunning, incredible, unbelievable, phenomenal, outstanding, monumentous, unusual, uncommon, unique, surprising, fantastic, terrific, tremendous, super, Maybe you don't know. Thank you, Holy Spirit. At the end of the eye exam, at the end of the eye exam, he said, I, she said, I don't know what happened, but this is remarkable. Her eyes went from 2150 to 2070. You know what? I, I, that's, that's almost 100% improvement where, where it literally turned around in a 180. So the cool thing is, is that the doctor said, well, well, we're just going to try to get down to 2040. But I know a God. Maybe you don't understand what I'm doing, and if you don't get it, that's okay. But I know a God that's going to restore her sight to 2020, so that way this doctor who, is, who has got knowledge up here, maybe she doesn't have a faith or understand who my God is, but my God already told me that I'm going to see the miraculous, mighty hand of God at work in my daughter's eye, and I'm already seeing it. You are overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. Your word holds power. You are rabbi. You may not feel it all the time. Who in the world says you got to feel it all the time? But when you walk around with your head held up walking in victory, guess what? The devil takes notice and he gets a little nervous. He says, what in the world is Sister Kay praising God for? I'm throwing everything I can at her and she's still worshiping God. See, there's power in your praise. There's power in your word and your testimony. We bring forth life. I'm standing here today because I'm putting the devil on notice. They that whatever he's throwing, it ain't gonna work. All over the house, we lift your hands, and we're gonna honor God's presence. God, you are greater, and God, you are stronger. God, you are higher than anything that we may face. Our God is our healer. You are awesome in power. You are our God. There is no other God like you. There is no other God but you, Lord God. There is no other name given to man where we may be saved, Lord God. We just want to bless your name. God, we honor your presence in this house, God. I thank you for the liberty that's in the house of the Lord this morning. God, we just lift up your name. We magnify you, God. And for the next 30 seconds, Lord God, God, we just praise and we magnify your holy name, God. Let your spirit just break loose in this house, God. From the front, oh my Jesus, God, from the both sides of this church, God, from the front to the back, God, break people's minds loose in this house. Break off bondage in this house, God. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And God, we lift up and magnify the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus that we are saved. God, we bless your holy name and we honor you, God, today.
Father, we just worship you this morning. God, we give you glory. Break out in this place, Spirit. Let 
Tell them you're glad to see them in God's house this morning. Just hug their necks and tell them you're glad to see them here today as we worship in the Word. Here, just a moment. the Lord. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning and worshiping Him today? It's not just another Sunday, is it? It's an opportunity to go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're going to continue on in worship this morning. I want to give you a couple of announcements today before we go into our time of giving. I want to make sure that if you're a newcomer with us, if this is your first time or maybe uh, your third, fourth, fifth time, maybe you've never been to a lunch with Pastor before, we want you to join us on July 8th for our next lunch with Pastor and some of our leadership team here. And uh, we want to welcome you into Remedy and get you more connected, tell you more about who we are and explain the vision to you. Because we believe that our vision is a vision from God. God said, Jesus said for us to go into all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And we want to make disciples. We want to make people understand what it means to truly be loved by Jesus Christ. Our vision here is for you to experience the real love of Jesus, because that's what we've experienced, the real love of Jesus. And often the love of Jesus looks different than what a lot of people paint the picture of it. And so we want to, we want to try to keep... His love real here. We won't want to put up the sod on. We want you to know that we are only here because we've been changed by the blood of Jesus. And so we want you to be connected to that. And while I'm uh, talking about that, I want you to know that in our bulletin, there's a flat that you can fold out. If it's your first time or you're new here with us, we want you to fill that out. If you have a prayer request uh, that you'd like for us to be praying for, and we, we kind of reserve those those flaps for uh, first-time guests and newcomers. Uh, we also have a pastor's prayer card. If you've been coming here 
And uh, you have a prayer need or something you want us to be praying about, use that pastor's card for your prayer request. But if you're a newcomer specifically, we want to know who you are because we want to pray with you. And we believe in the power of prayer that God truly answers our prayers when we pray. He's an awesome, powerful, on-time God. And we know that when we call out to Him, He hears us. And so, so we want you to fill that out and give us uh, a prayer need if you have one and connect with us. Maybe you don't, maybe you can't think of one, but we want you to fill that out anyway. Give us your information. We'll follow up with you. We want to see what God's doing in your life, and we want to connect you here to Remedy Church as well. We've got some uh, different things going on. July 1st, I want you to remember, there's going to be a top prayer over at our Roberta campus. Uh, we want to pray over the facility and anoint the facility and ask the Lord to uh, lay His hand upon the next season for that facility and for our church. And so from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on July 1st, it's a Sunday night, you shouldn't be doing anything else. All right, we don't have church on Sunday nights. So 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., we're asking for an hour of your time on that Sunday to come by and pray with us. And uh, we're going to anoint the facility and ask God to, to be in the work there. Amen? So we're going to be doing that. We're also looking to do some things later on in the month over at our Roberta campus, so just kind of be on the lookout for that. We're still getting stuff together, and I'll give you more details as we get uh, closer to that time. If I could have our ushers come on uh, up and help me with our time of giving this morning. How many of you believe that you give to what you love? I love my children, so I give things to them, even when I don't want to. Sometimes they're just so cute, I can't help it, right? We, spoil, there's, we say all the time we're spoiled, and I turn around and think, well, it's my own fault. But we give to what we love, amen, and I love my church. And uh, this morning, I want you to pray about what the Lord would have you to give today, Remedy. If it's your first time with us this morning, we don't expect any money from you. We just want you to slip that prayer card in the offering bags as they come by. And, uh, on your way out, we have a free t-shirt for you. If you uh, desire to get one of those, we want you to have that because we, we consider you a part of the family. We want you to know that you belong here. And so as the offering comes by, whether you're giving your offering today or you're giving a prayer card, we want you to know that God sees all that you do in the kingdom. And that well, is very clear about the principle of sowing and reaping. If you want to reap great things in the kingdom of God, you've got to sow great things into the kingdom of God. And so we want to encourage you to give today. Let's pray over the offering before we take it up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you and we thank you, Father, for all that you do. And God, we just submit this day to you, God, and I submit this offering to you, Father. You see each and every one of us as we give uh, of, of what we have. And Father, I pray that you would bless the giver today as they could sow seed into good soil today, Father, so that the ministry of this church, this body, can continue to go forth. And we thank you and we praise you for all that you're doing through our church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you as you give this morning. time of giving this morning, I want you to turn to your Bibles, turn your Bibles to chapter 26 of Genesis. Chapter 26 of Genesis, we're going to be in verses 12 through 25. I know it's a little bit longer of a passage, but I want to read this to you. I think the Lord has something to say to us on this Father's Day. How many of you are thankful for a wonderful father in your life? Some of you might say, well, I don't, I don't know if I could say that. You have a wonderful heavenly father who cares for you and loves you. He gives you all the things that you have, and you're only sitting here because of a Father in heaven. And I'm thankful today for every man that's sowed into my life, whether it's my physical, biological father, or a spiritual father on the earth, or if it's my heavenly father, I know that I have been blessed because of great men who've come into my life and done great things. I'm thankful for that. And I believe that God has something to say to us today in Genesis chapter 26, verses 12 through 25. If you'll go ahead and put uh, verse 12 up for me, I'm going to read. Uh, from the New Living up here with you guys for this morning. It says, When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted, for the Lord blessed him. Verse 13, keep going with you. He became a very rich man, and his wealth continued to grow. 
He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle and servants, that the Philistines became jealous of him. And verse 15 goes on to say the Philistines filled up all of the Isaac's wells, all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. Finally, Abimelech, who was the king at the time, ordered Isaac to leave the country. He told him, go somewhere else, he said, for you've become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to Gerar Valley, or the Valley of Gerar, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells. Check this out. He reopened the wells his father had dug in the Valley of Gerar, which the Philistines had filled in, in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But when the shepherds from Gerar came and claimed the spring, they said, this is our water. And they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Essex, say Essex, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well, but again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, say Sitna, which means hostility. Verse 22, abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug yet another well. This time there was no dispute over it, so Isaac named the place Rehoboth, say Rehoboth, which means open space. And he said, at last the Lord has created enough space for us verse 23, to prosper this land. Verse 23 says, from there, Isaac moved to Beersheba. This is a very significant thing that happens right here, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you. I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. Then Isaac, get this, built an altar there, and worshiped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place, and his servants dug another well. The story of a lot of wells here. A lot of strife and hostility and confusion. I want us to pray over this word and ask the Lord to speak to us what he would this morning over this special day of fathers as we talk about Isaac redigging the wells of his father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you and we ask you today to bless this word. Bless our ears, God, to hear what you're saying. Father, I pray that the words that I speak this morning would be yours not my own, that they would be covered by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for every man in here that is a father, that should have been a father, that is going to be a father. And God, I pray that you would touch their hearts this morning, the deep places of their spirit. And God, I ask that you would move upon them and make them into mighty men of valor after your heart. God, I pray that you would touch families this morning. As they come together, God, I pray that you would reaffirm the family today. God, you have instituted it, God, as your way of strength and your way by which your word will be carried out. You have established fathers as the priests of their home. And God, today I pray that you would bring revelation to a father somewhere, God, who needs a word from you today. God, strengthen us by it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The weight of a man is heavy. Men were destined to carry a, a very heavy burden. And I want to encourage you today, men, not to run from your destiny. Many of us are sitting in here with all kinds of examples of men in our life that have gone before us, some good, some bad. But we can all take from the example that's set before us, whether it's an example that says, I want to follow in the footsteps of the man that came before me, my father, or if it's an example that says, I want to stay away from the path that my father took, maybe. You need to understand today that you are sitting under the weight of a heavenly father. That no matter what your earthly example looks like, there is a God this morning that has loved you and that has called you to a purpose this morning. You have a purpose, man of God. And you're destined to carry something very heavy. So I want to encourage you not to be a man that runs from his destiny. You weren't meant to have it easy, men. They come out with uh, recliners and lazy boys. 
right? I've got one in my house that on Sunday afternoon, if I sit down in it, I'm in trouble. Because if I sit down in that thing before I know it, my eyes are closing on me without me even trying. There's something about a man that loves a good recliner, right? I heard somebody say, I don't remember who I was talking to, they were saying, I'm going to get a recliner that even stands me up out of it. I want it to lay me all the way back and stand me all the way up. Right? Well, there's something about a man that loves a recliner. It, you know, and, and, and I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about my recliner. Last night I fell asleep in my recliner. I woke up, I said, I don't know why I do this. And I said, yeah, I do because it's comfortable. And there's something about a recliner that a man loves, and I think it's because it's comfortable. We sit down and the weight is lifted. Right? We, we carry men. Now, 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 ladies, you might not realize it, but men carry things around. But when, when I was younger, I used to get so angry at my dad sometimes. Because I'd ask him a question about my life, about something that was going on, and I really needed some guidance, and I didn't feel comfortable talking about it with anybody else, and I even felt kind of awkward talking to him about some things. And I'd ask him uh, something, and he wouldn't say nothing. We'd be driving down the road. I'd say, Dad, I need to, what do you think about this? He'd wait five seconds, then he'd just change the subject. And I get so mad, thinking, I don't know why my dad's not, I don't know why you're not saying that. I'm asking you for for, uh, for something. I'm asking you for guidance, for help, for advice. And let alone, about two days later, my dad would come back to me. he say, you know, I was thinking about what you said the other day. By then, I'd be like, what? I don't even remember that conversation. He, he said, my dad is, he's quick to listen and slow to speak, Right? My dad is a good godly dad. He's a man who has shown me what it means to be a man and what it means to be a man of God. I'm thankful for that. I grew up with a father who, who was able to show me those things, right? And so he, he would come back to me a couple of days later and he'd say, I was thinking about what you were talking about and this is what I think. And ladies, if you don't realize that men carry things around. We don't, we don't operate in the same way men and women don't. We... We, men, men are emotional, but we're emotionally different than women are. We're, we're, we, we function in two completely separate ways, and yet God in His goodness has designed us both so beautifully. And, and, and we have complex ways that we carry out our life, and sometimes it can feel like, and the men could give me an amen, it could feel like I just want to run sometimes because of how heavy life gets. Because I know in my heart of hearts that I can't truly and always express how I'm feeling in that moment because I know that God has set me up to fulfill certain roles in the life of my family. I'm a protector. I'm a strength, right? I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not devaluing the role of the woman or the wife in the family. You can't have a family without a woman or without a wife. You can't do it. You, and it's hard to... And, and, you know, there are single mothers and single fathers, and God has granted you the grace to fulfill the roles that you need to fulfill during that time. But I'm just going to tell you that men and women are designed a different way, and when heaviness comes on, there's sometimes that you just want to run from it. And, and I think about my recliner, and I think, man, I'd just love to be sitting there doing nothing. Men, you ever felt that way? I'd like to just go in the house and sit down and do nothing. Sometimes I do. We, we like... We like comfort. But man, I want to encourage you today to understand that you weren't meant for easy. You were not meant for easy. You were meant and destined for greatness, so you were built for battle and you were equipped for victory. You need to, I'm going to say that again because y'all didn't get that. Men, you're not built for easy. You're meant for greatness, so God has built you according to that by building you for battle. You are the priest of your home. And because you're the priest of your home, it is first and foremost your responsibility to go to war in the Spirit for your family. You were built for battle, and you were equipped for victory. God has designed you in such a way that you can go about your life fighting the heavy battles for your family and for the people that are in your circle of influence, and He has equipped you not just to fight the battle, but I need to remind some men today that you are not in this thing to lose it. God has equipped you for victory this morning. You were built for battle, and you were equipped 
for victory. God has given you the things and the tools that you need to succeed in your life. And we read about a man named Isaac. Isaac is who we consider one of the patriarchs of our lineage. He is the, the one of the patriarchs of mankind. He comes and is descended from his father, Abraham, who we know is the father of all nations, and all nations are blessed because of him. And we look at the story of Isaac in chapter 26 of Genesis, and we see that it says he dwelt in a place called Gerar. Now, Gerar is not unfamiliar to us if we're reading Scripture by chapter 26 because Gerar was a place where Abraham, excuse me, where Abraham, his father, said Now, dads, if you don't know this by now, let me just warn you, caution you, and guide you in the fact that your children will attempt to walk wherever you have walked. As a man, as a father, for sons and daughters, you are a pace setter and you are a pathfinder for your children. We've got to be careful about the paths that we walk, fathers, because your children will inevitably, at some time or another, step foot on the same paths that you have. It's not something that God has necessarily ordained to say that your children must walk where you are, but it's God's design that a father should follow in the example, or the son should follow in the example of his father. And you as a parent, and let me just speak to moms and dads for a moment, wherever you are, in whatever chapter you're in, the steps that your children see you take are the steps that they will one day walk out themselves if you're not careful. God has called you to be a wayfinder, a pathfinder, a trendsetter for your children, for them to understand how paths work and how they're supposed to walk out the life that they have been given in God. And Gerar was a place where Isaac's father once lived. And our sons and daughters are watching where we walk. So we must be purposeful in setting the pace for our children and setting them on the right path for life. Graduation just happened for a lot of people. Some of us in the room today have students that next year they might be sitting where some parents this year are, watching their children about to graduate. Some of you have had children graduate already, and there are things that have brought, been brought to your children in life that you look at and you say, I wish I would have prepared them better, or I'm so glad that they're in this season and they're prepared for this. Inevitably, as humans, we know that we have flaws and we make mistakes and we're all in a different chapter of life, but it really comes to life, I think. I know it did for me as a son when I graduated high school and I went off to college and set out on my own. There was a new dynamic to my life. I could live how I wanted to by the rules that I set up for myself, and I had the choice to go whatever way I wanted to, and there were times that I did go my own way, but I am thankful for a legacy and an example that came before me, and most of all, I'm thankful for the glorious grace of Jesus Christ that came into my life, and though I had my own choice to go my own way and did sometimes, it's by the love and the grace of God that I am standing here today, that when I had my own choice and there was a path before me that I could have taken, God looked at me and said, Son, that is not the path I want you to take. And it's by His glorious grace this morning that I stand as a son of God following the path that Jesus has set out before me. There are paths that we walk, that our children will walk because they're watching us. They gain their reference points from us. And just like Abraham in the land of Gerar, the same reason Abraham did it, Isaac found himself in a situation where he was a foreigner in a strange land. And there was a king by the name of Abimelech. And Isaac knew, because if you if you scroll kind of back toward the beginning of this chapter, you will see that Isaac had a, an encounter with God. And God said the same thing to Isaac that he said to Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a father of nations. I'm going to bless you with descendants that will bless other people. He gave the same thing to Isaac that he gave, gave to Abraham. And he told Isaac to get up and go to a land in which I'll show you. And Isaac finds himself in Gerar, a place where his father had settled at one time. And 
the, the same thing that happened to Abraham begins to happen to Isaac. As a matter of fact, some scholars say that Abimelech may have been the same Abimelech that Abraham came across. Or it could have been the, the family name of a dynastic royal family, okay? So we, we've got to understand that he's, he's walking this path that Abraham walked. He's in the land that Abraham was in. He's doing the things that Abraham was doing. And the king of Abimelech comes to him. Now, Isaac does something very, very odd here to us in today's world, but it's the same thing that Abraham did. When they came to Isaac, Isaac passed off his wife, Rebekah, as his sister. Is the Bible says that he did it because he was afraid that they would kill him. And that makes a lot of sense to some of us, but you need to know this, is that when you're a foreigner in a strange land in the time that Isaac lived, to be included in the activities and the privileges that they had in the land, it was sometimes necessary for a foreigner to give a woman to uh, a, a ruler's harem, to his, his, his kingdom, as the king's wife. He had to basically uh, bribe his way in by the usage of a woman of his family. And so, and, and here's the deal. Many times for foreigners, what would happen was is if a woman, if they were unwilling to give the woman up to be included in the benefit of the land, they would kill the man and they would take the woman anyway. And so, for fear of his life, he said, she's my sister. This is familiar with Abraham's story. Abraham passed Sarah off as his sister because he was afraid that if they found out it was his wife, he would, he would be killed. Why? Because they were not willing to give their wives up as foreigners in the land. They were, they were a protector. They, were not going to do, they weren't going to do anything that, that set their families up for failure. And so they passed their, their wives off as sisters. And, and what happens is, is one day Abimelech, He's looking out his window. And this is me just kind of paraphrasing and telling the, the Killian version of the story, okay? Hey, he's looking out his window, and he sees Isaac showing affection to his wife, Rebecca. And so Abimelech calls for Isaac to come in, and he said, Why are you going about doing what you're doing in that way? You said she was your sister. And he said, I only told you that because I was afraid that for my life that I'd be killed. She's really my wife. And the, the words of God echoed in Isaac's ears that said, you will be blessed. And it was from that moment that they allowed Isaac to live in the land of Gerar, and he was blessed to be there. The Bible goes on to say that he is, that he's farming the land. And everything that he, he planted came back to him a hundredfold. He was in a, land, a strange land with strange people. He was a foreigner, and he, yeah, he was a farmer that was, when he sowed, he reaped a hundredfold. I'm telling you, there's something about living right and getting in with God. But you can be in a strange land. You can be in a strange season of life. You can be in a place that doesn't make a lot of sense to you. You can be in a place where you're fearful and, and, and more than you are faithful, and yet God is so good that He'll come into your life and whatever you have sowed into His kingdom, you're going to reap a hundredfold because your Father loves you. He was in a strange land. He was in a strange season. He was reaping what he was sowing. And it, it, it got so good that the Philistines rose up and they said, Look, you've become too rich and powerful for us to compete with you or deal with you. They didn't want to deal, deal with them anymore. You see, they started realizing who this Isaac was. They started realizing what was going on in his life, and they said, you've got to get out of here because we don't want to deal with you anymore. And so he, he made his way from Gerar to a specific place that they called the Valley of Gerar. And this was a place that also his father Abraham had settled. He's walking out a path that his father had walked. And when he got there, it says that he did something very significant, and the Lord stopped me when I saw this. It said he reopened the wells that his father had done. And the Holy Spirit asked me and, and, and kind of prompted me with this question. Fathers, what kind of wells are you digging for your children? Because there, there are going to be seasons that they walk in that they're going to need to pull something 
from the ones that came before them, and they're going to be walking something out that they need guidance on, and that they need something to sustain them and to give them life in a dry and, 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 and weird season of their life. They're going to have to pull from the wells that you dig. So, fathers, what wells are you digging for your children? It said he reopened the wells of his father Abraham, and then when he did that, they, they, they dug down and there was water there, and as soon as he did, there were shepherds in the valley of Gerard that came up and said, whoa, 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 hang on. And even, even though these wells hadn't been opened, these wells are ours because they're on, on the land that we farm on. And as they dug down and they opened up the well of their father, he, he said, I'm going to name this well Essek because they're, they're quarreling with me over what's going on. And they moved on and they began to dig another well because they it doesn't matter what season you're in or where you're going, you've got to have something that will sustain you and give you life. And so they enter into another place and they dig another well and they get to the bottom of it. And here come those shepherds again. And just like they had claimed the first well of Abraham, they're now claiming this is our well as well. And as they got to the bottom and opened it up and the shepherds came, and Isaac said, this well is going to be called Stephen. Because now they're not just arguing with us and giving us strife. They're bringing hostility to us. They're driving us from place to place. And fathers, I'm just going to let you know right now that your children throughout their life, they're going to work and work to find their way. And along life's path, they're going to encounter strife and they're going to encounter hostility. And it's going to be your example, Father, as the priest of your home, that determines whether they will sit in strife and hostility and waste away to nothing, or if they will move on and continue to dig wells. Somebody ought to say amen. I'm preaching a lot better than y'all are shouting. I'm going to tell you. It's, it's, it's up to you, Father. Look, I know that I'm, I'm placing a heavy burden on your shoulders, but you were meant for greatness. And you, your children, they will sit and strike and hostility for as long as your lessons teach them to. But when you stand up and you tell your son, I'm proud of you, your daughter, I believe in you, you can do this, you can keep going, it's your words. I'm going to tell you, you can get a million hugs from mama, but you get one, I'm proud of you, from daddy, and it goes a million miles. Again, that's not to devalue mama, but there's something, there, there's a difference between the relationship between children and mother, and we celebrated that two weeks. So, ladies, y'all sit back, we celebrated y'all already. The best dad's going to get today is a hat or a tie. So, just let, just let us be today. Father's, the weight is heavy, heavy on you. Your, your children are looking at the example that you're setting, the lessons that you're teaching, and it will be up to you whether they sit in strife and hostility for every season of their life or will they continue to dig wells for generations after you. What legacy are you leaving? What wells are you digging? What work are you showing? What are you putting in now so that for generations after you, your children and your children's children will continue to dig wells of blessing, he found himself in the valley of Gerard. He was viewed as a rich foreigner, and then he was asked to leave. And he went to the valley of Gerard. Isaac dug up the wells of his father Abraham, and we've got to know what we're doing and what we're leaving for our children to inherit. And I'm not just talking about stuff. We, we talk about last wills and testaments. We talk about being ready for that. And, you know, there, there are people saying, well, I'm going to get this when you die, and I'm going to get that, and I'm going to get this. Come on, y'all don't act like I'm being morbid. Y'all heard it. And I had a lady talking to me the other day. They said, Pastor, can you believe my children came up to me and said, hey, I want that when you die. You know, concerned about the stuff. But let, let me encourage you, moms and dads. Don't just leave your kids stuff. Because your stuff will waste away. But your principles will last forever again. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you, if your principles are not based on the Word of God, your principles will waste away too. Because your principles are not His principles. But if you base your life around His Word, the Bible said the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. That's why the Bible says, raise up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And when they get there, 
their own way, they'll not depart from what you've taught them. It's because when you plant the Word of God in something, it's going to bring forth fruit. When you plant the Word of God in something, it will come back to you. Whatever you have sown, you will reap, and you're going to reap a harvest of the fruit of the Word of the Lord if the Word of the Lord is what you're planting in your children. Let me encourage you today, fathers, it's not too late to start. Maybe you say, my season has, has come and gone and my children are grown now. But I'm going to tell you right now, as a father, if you'll begin to speak the word of life into them, you will instill something in them that will change the course of their life. It might change their season. It might change their situation. You might not have the stuff. You might not have the money. You might not have anything else to give them to get their life back on track. But, Daddy, if you will claim the Word of God over your family and get the spirit of Joshua and say, My season might have changed, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If you'll make it up in your mind to say that, you'll change your children's lives. We looked last week. And in Abraham, in Genesis chapter 22, who was asked to go and sacrifice his promise of Isaac. This is the same Isaac that laid on a bed of wood, getting ready to be killed by his own father, because that's what God asked him to do. Abraham was willing to go, and Abraham at the time did not know it, but his obedience and the lesson that his son saw from the table of in the altar of wood was the lesson that he would need when he found himself in the valley of Gerar. Abraham didn't know it in chapter 22. And, and all the way back in 17, we know that God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, I'm going to bless you with descendants, and they're going to bless other nations. And if you will obey me, I will bless you. And in chapter 22, Abraham obeys him by placing Isaac on the altar of wood in a place of worship to obey God. And in that moment, Isaac was taught something that he didn't even realize was being instilled into his spirit. But in chapter 26, I just have to believe that what Abraham did on top of that mountain when he laid Isaac on the table, Isaac now knew that no matter what comes against me, no matter what I see, no matter where I go, I have to obey the Lord because when I do that, I will be blessed and my children will be too. The chapter 22 lesson that he got was the 26th blessing that he's going to get. The 26th blessing that he got was one that came through his obedience that said, even though I'm a foreigner and even though what my father built has been lost, I'm going to honor who he was by continuing to dig a well. And the Bible says that they went on after that last well was dug in Sitna and they dug one more well. And children, let me turn my face to you for a second. Sons and daughters, if you can know anything, know that life will not hand you everything that you need to go to the next level, but that God has equipped you through His heavenly goodness. And most of you, hopefully all of you, through a daddy that loved you and showed you the way to go. And if you will press in and do the work, you will be blessed. It's not going to be handed to you. My mom and dad are good to me. I moved to Capitalist Concord in 2011. I, I got two weeks with them living in my car. And I knew I could go back home. I had a home waiting for me back in Murphy. But I knew that God had called me here. At the time, I, I was in love and thought it was because of Megan. And it was, in part. But I had no idea what my path held. I had no, no idea that on Father's Day 2018 I'd be preaching this message, but I just believed. I believed in my heart that God had set me on that path, and I was two weeks from living in my car out here. It don't just come to you, young people. It don't just happen. you got to get out there and do it. you got to look at your fathers, whether it be physical, biological, or heavenly, and say, I know that my father is good. And I trust in Him that if He's called me to it, that He will get me to where I'm going, but I've got to do something on my part. You see, faith is more than just asking God to hand everything to you on a silver platter. Some of you are about to go to youth camp. You're going to get all kinds of words put in you, and you're going to get all kinds of time and worship and God moving in your heart and your life. But you need to know this about God, is that as much faith as you have in Him, He's got enough faith in you that He designed you so that you could do a part in it as well. 
You have to partner with God. Faith is doing everything that you can do and leaving what you can't do up to God. Is this okay? Can I speak to our young people just real quick? Oh, you, you, you've got to put in the work, young people. And, and if you want fruit in your life and you want blessing in your life, you need to honor your mother and your father. The Bible said that if you honor your father and your mother, anybody know what it says? Your days will be lengthened. One day you're going to be an old person. The seasons that you live are determined by your honor for your father and mother. The blessings that you have are determined by how much you honor your parents. And you don't honor them by just saying, I love you, Mom and Dad. You don't honor them by just hugging on them when you see them. You don't, you don't honor them by just being who you are. You honor them by living out a life that they have taught you. And while they don't define right and wrong, they're showing you the way to the Word of God. And you need to hear that and walk in it. Your honor for your parents comes from your footsteps, not your lips. And so you've got to honor. And, and, and listen, church. Let, and fathers specifically, listen to me. Fathers, if you don't honor your children, and children, if you don't honor your father, nobody's going to honor the Lord. I'm going to say that again. Fathers, if you don't honor your children by digging wells for them, children, if you're not honoring your parents by walking in what they've done for you, then nobody's going to honor the Lord. I think one of the greatest weapons of the enemy in the church today is generational gaps. The devil is working as hard as he can for the, for the boomers and for the builders and the millennials and, and Generation X, Y, Z, Q, P, R, T, whatever they are now. He's working his hardest to turn us against each other. Because something very powerful happens when the people of God come together. And if generations can come, hear me today, if generations can come together, revival will be birthed in the kingdom of God. If the old and the young will come together, if fathers and mothers and sons and daughters will be raised up and come together in generational synergy, the kingdom of God will see fire and revival again. This founded this movement, the Church of God, what we're a part of, it was founded on a family altar in the fire of God. It was founded on mothers and fathers and sons and daughters coming together and getting in a prayer closet around a family altar and saying, God, we submit ourselves to you again. God, we want to hear what you have to say. God, we want to go where you tell us to go. And they forced the path so that today the church of God has over 7 million people in it. And it has people who are experiencing the power of the Pentecostal Holy Spirit of God that, that comes to them and empowers them to live their life. I'm thankful for people who forge the way before me, but I'm also thankful for innovative young people that will step into the place of honor for their parents and for God and how they were designed so that the movement of God can continue on. We've got to come together, family of God. We're not honoring our children by digging wells. And children, if you're not honoring fathers by walking in their path, no one will honor the Lord. So they dug another well. This third well, Isaac looked around and the shepherds were nowhere to be found. And he says he named that well Rehoboth. Say Rehoboth. Rehoboth. He named it Rehoboth because he said, for the Lord, Rehoboth actually means open spaces. Open spaces. It's, it's God's decluttered this thing. God has made room for us, is what he said. Rehoboth. And, and, and let, me, let me just say this. If you want God to make room for you, you got to dig a well. And you got to keep digging wells. And you got to keep digging wells. And as many wells as you dig, for whatever opposition comes your way, whatever it is that you're facing, if you just keep digging wells, God is faithful to make room for you. If you'll just keep digging, man of God, woman of God, son or daughter of God, if you'll keep digging, God will make room for you. He called it Rehoboth because he said, God has finally made room 
for us. And it gave them substance to sustain them with life and sustain them with water in a foreign land, in a strange place with strange people who were on their every side. And then it says something very significant. It says that they moved on to a town called Beersheba. Beersheba is the next place that Abraham lived. Isaac walked the path that Abraham did. And I, I want you to notice something, that when, when Abraham met with God, God said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you children and descendants that will ble- be, be blessed, and the nations will be blessed through your descendants if you'll get up and go to a land that I will show you. He comes to Isaac and says, I'm going to give you descendants, and they'll be blessed, and they'll, they will bless others through you in your obedience if you'll get up to go to a land that I will show you. And it, it's just, it's more than a coincidence that Isaac walked from Gerar to the valley of Gerar to uh, Beersheba. He walked the path of his father, and when he got there, the Lord met with him. You see, Beersheba was a, was a place where Abraham settled. And, and Isaac finds himself in Beersheba, and he goes in and sees the Lord. It says, the Lord came to him. And what you need to know is in the beginning of chapter 26, he come, the Lord comes to Isaac and tells him, and he makes a covenant with him just as he did Abraham, and says, I'll bless you with all of these things if you obey me. And Isaac got to the place in which he would settle and build his camp, and the Lord shows up there, and he says again to Isaac, and he establishes a covenant like he did with Abraham, if you'll do all of these things, I will give you all of these children, I'll give you descendants, you will be blessed through them, and the nations will be blessed through them because of your obedience. And it says, Isaac, this does something very important. He built an altar. He didn't dig a well, he built an altar. There are too many fathers looking for wells when they have yet to build an altar. Abraham, when he walked his path, wherever God said for him to go, when he got there, he built an altar. Isaac is the third patriarch. He, he is he is uh, another patriarch that came and. And it says that he built an altar where he went. He's the, he's the next one that built an altar to worship God when God got him to the land that he was going to show him. And fathers, you need to hear me this morning. You were not meant for easy. And while digging wells, if you, I'm, I've never personally dug a well, but I've, I've done a hole, dug a hole for a mailbox, and that's enough for me. And while well is, wells are work, the end result is blessing, long-term blessing. For building an altar, fathers, you're going to build altars, and you're going to worship God in places that end with wells dug by your children that you may never see from the past. There are places in your life that you're going to go and you're going to sacrifice so that your children can have things that you may not even see. Let that sink in for you. Let that inform the way that you think about the inheritance that you're leaving the children. Now, I believe some of you have walked paths and you have you have reopened the wells that your father had dug for you and you 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 lived off of that and now there's a place in your life where you've struck out on your own. Some of you have been on your own for a while. Some of you are in your we'll put it the way that many kids did this morning, you're in your most wise season. You've lived off the wells of your father, and now you're in a, somebody, somebody might be in a season where God's calling you to build an altar. You see, for every well that's dug, there was first an altar that was built. For every 
place of God that has blessing and favor. Their first obedience and sacrifice. Men of God, hear me today. You were not created for easy. Some of you are in seasons that feel extremely heavy. Some of you are in seasons where you think, I've been carrying this load for as long as I can carry it. Lord, I thought at some point it was going to get harder and God's calling you to build another altar. Think about this, men. Your refusal to build the last altar that God is calling you to build. This may be the last one that you get to build. Tomorrow is not promised. This may be the last command of God for you. You, you. you don't know you've got tomorrow. You might be 25 and you might be 85. No matter what you age you are, no matter what season you're in, tomorrow is not promised for you. And I'm asking you today, has God asked you to build an altar? And if He has, if you refuse, what are you sacrificing in your children? Isaac was living off of wells that were, that were dug by his father. And he came to a place where his father was, and they had to live again. And he built an altar there, it says, and he encamped there, and he worshipped the Lord. And it says, after he built the altar, he dug another well. Fathers, if you want to bless your children, I hear the Spirit of God saying that there's something that someone needs to sacrifice today. There's something that you need to lay on the altar before God and put fire to it. There is something that you need to obey the Lord in this morning. Maybe you're a father today and you're one. You're, there, there are often times I think, I don't know if I'll ever do it. I don't know if I'll ever be able to be the father that God has destined me to be. I don't, I don't know if I will. If I, I look around and, and the spirit of comparison will jump on me if you're not careful. I look around and go, I wish, I wish I was a better dad like this person. But I wish I had the ability to, to do this or to do that. Or I wish, I wish, I wish. Father, man of God, hear me today. You are exactly what your children are. In this season and every season, God has gifted you with your children to make people legacy. And it's no desire for any father that their child be hindered because of their own willingness to go the distance. Say, Pastor, I have a gentle little father. He dug wells for me, and I feel good wonderfully because of the wells that were dug for me. I've been sustained by the wells that were dug for me. Some of you think you didn't have an earthly father that you did, but you need to know today maybe you didn't have an earthly father, but you do have a heavenly father that has sustained you to get you to where you are today. And some of you are sitting in here that don't have an earthly father example. Your greatest fear is I don't want to be the dad that my dad was. I'm going to tell you this morning, you don't have to be. God has equipped you with everything that you need to walk in the season of your life. God has given you the ability, giftedness, faith, capacity to submit your life to God. We will sustain you. Here's the good thing about God. I flip from Genesis chapter 26 over to the New Testament where a man by the name of Jesus is standing with a woman at I'm 
Everything that happens in the Word of God is culminating toward moments like this from where Jesus is standing. There's people like you and me that are well. And He wants you to know today, whatever land you find yourself in, whatever season you find yourself in, whatever surrounds you, whatever you do, Whatever feels like your life is dead, and whatever circumstance tells you, Jesus on the cross, and the grave, and the life of the Father has been born. He gives an altar of sacrifice, a cross, a Calvary. He worships God by saying, Not my will be done, but yours, Lord. He encamps at the right hand of the Father. The well that for all of eternity you can drink from. Father, I know you're tired. Dad, I know you're tired. Dad, I, I know that you're going to leave this season. You understand, man, this didn't turn out like I thought it would. Man, I really messed up right there, man. I, my father was good to me, but who am I pulling from for in this moment? Some of you are looking back and thinking, My father was good to me. I want my kids to say the same thing about me, but I just don't know if I can do it. It was a well this was a well. I just happen to believe that in this moment, there's a father in here. There might just be one dad in here this morning. That decides to dig a well in this altar today. He comes up here and says, God, I don't care who's in the room this morning or what they think. I'm going to go up and I'm going to make an altar and I'm going to say some things on the altar and I'm going to burn it down. And I'm going to get up from that place and I'm going to go dig wells for my family one more time. I don't care if I've got a shovel. I don't care if I've got to scrape it with my fingernails. I'm digging a well here. I'm going to lay something down. I'm going to lay my insignificance down. I'm going to lay my low self-image down. I'm going to lay my heaviness down. I'm going to lay my tiredness down. I'm going to lay everything down that's preventing my children from seeing what they need to see in me, through God. I'm going to lay it down, and I'm going to walk out of here, and I'm going to dig another well. There are young men in here. You're not a father yet, but you better start digging wells now because you better start building altars and digging wells now because there's going to come a day that if you don't teach yourself right now or if you don't pull from the things that you know right now on building altars, it'll be too late. There are things that you need right now in this moment. Stand with me all over God's house if you're a father. Hey, everyone stand, but if you're a father, and you say, Pastor, through this morning, I want to make a decision. My children are hurting. My children are being hindered. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the lid to the well this morning. I've just... I've just come to the end of myself. I don't know how to do this anymore. I need that well, Jesus. I'm going to have another time of prayer just for the Father. If that's you, would you come to the altar? I'm so tired. I just don't know what I can do. I just don't know what I can do with God's call. You need to be a you find a way to do I'm walking through a season where my children are living, and I'm just so tired. I'm living this life with the problems and the burdens that I can't handle. I'm just so tired of my shoulders. I just choose to live a little bit. This is a defining moment for me as a father. Elders, as you just begin to come and pray, you're not in need of prayer yourself. I, I want, I want a place. I want God to make room for me. 
It's time to dig deep, fathers. This part is hard for anybody, but men especially, because we don't want to lay pride down and say that I have a need or that I can't do it on my own. I can't make this happen for me. I, I can't be Superman anymore. I can't. I'm not the hero to this story. Is that you this morning? Some of you, it's time to build. For some of you, it's time to dig wells for your children. For some of you, it's time to lay something down. It's time to sacrifice something. Some of you need to burn something up and let it be consumed in the fire of God this morning. I need, I need some prayer warriors. I need more people to come up here and pray. Would you come, Sister Kevin? Sister Christine, would you come up and pray? Just lift your hands this morning. Father, we just worship you. God, and we give you glory this morning because you're so good to us. God, you're a heavenly Father. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift. Help us to recognize. God, that a culture of honor in our homes will result in fruit in the kingdom. And help us to realize that a culture of honor in our homes will result in and fruit in the kingdom. God, that as we honor one another with the path that we walk and as we honor you with both our hearts and our lips, as you're lifted up, God, that as we have a culture of honor about our lives, that it would produce fruit in the kingdom. Father, that love would abound, that uh, there would be, be an abundance of joy, God, that there would be an abundance of peace, God, that surrounds our homes. God, help us to fortify our walls with the Holy Spirit. God, help us to fortify our homes with the sustaining power of your word. God, let family altars be built. And God, because of the altar, God, help us to dig wells. God, that will sustain our families generation after generation after generation. God, bring blessing and favor to us. God, help us to never underestimate the power of sacrifice and obedience. God, we know that obedience is the covenant blessing of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. God, we just thank you, God, for what you're going to do. We know the best days are ahead of us, God, and we thank you as the bride of Christ. We thank you as a church this morning, God, for what you're doing in this house. God, as we have said in our hearts to say that as for us and this house, we will serve the Lord. God, you are our priests. God, you are the bride and groom. Lord, you are the leader of this house. God, as we submit ourselves to you as the body of Christ, God, I pray that you would just bring blessing and favor to the house. God, let us see miracle signs and wonders at every turn. Father, I pray that you would continue to bring deliverance and healing and salvation. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning. Join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We're going to be having classes for all ages. We thank you for being here today. We'll see you then.